modern bridge, there are now many technological aids which help the navigator. Devices which confirm his position show the positions of the shore and other vessels, indicate water depth, and enable him to communicate effectively. In busy shipping lanes, collision is a real and very expensive danger. A new system, properly called UAIS, or Universal Automatic Identification Systems, but usually known as AIS, has the potential, if used properly, to greatly assist the watchkeeper in identifying other vessels. However, its development was driven by other factors. Over a period of time, there has been interest by coastal states to have an idea what ships are in the vicinity of their coastline. And initially, they tried using the transponder technology that was used on aircraft, but uh, that was not found to be satisfactory. And then over a period of time, it was found that uh, digital selective calling DSC technology could be more appropriate for this matter. And accordingly, we trialed that technology. And finally, in, it was in May 1998 that IMO adopted performance standards for a universal automatic identification system. As winds tonight gusted to gale force, salvage operations around the wreck of the Brea were suspended. The wish to identify vessels in coastal waters was given added impetus by some high-profile pollution incidents. One involved the Brea, a Liberian registered tanker which had run aground on the Shetland Islands and spilled 85,000 gallons of crude oil into the sea. The United Kingdom government appointed a senior judge, Lord Donaldson, to look into the incident, and his report in 1994 suggested that the identification of vessels in foreign waters was a fundamental issue. In the light of Lord Donaldson's findings, the UK government submitted proposals to the International Maritime Organization for a system of automatic ship identification. Over a number of years, the technology which was to drive AIS was debated and refined. AIS enables ships to broadcast their identification automatically. It depends on two technologies, GPS positioning and VHF radio. Each vessel equipped with AIS continuously transmits and receives information on two dedicated VHF frequencies, channel 87B, or 161.975 megahertz and channel 88B or 162.025 megahertz. In the United States those frequencies are not available and alternative ones have been designated but AIS units adapt to these frequencies automatically without the user being aware of the change. Each ship is equipped with two independent VHF receivers tuned to the two AIS frequencies. The ship's own AIS also has a single VHF transmitter which alternates its transmissions back and forth between the two frequencies. All AIS receivers, both on ships and shore stations up to about 30 nautical miles away, will receive digital information which at a minimum identifies a particular ship. But AIS does not just help put a name to a radar target. It transmits a broad range of other information, in particular the vessel's position, speed and direction. Because the system uses VHF, it is relatively unhindered by line of sight restrictions. It can detect vessels obscured by headlands or islands and it often reaches further than radar. The range is partly determined by antenna height. AIS uses two principal antennas, one for GPS and the other which receives and transmits on VHF. This antenna should be sighted away from other VHF antennas to prevent interference. The GPS antenna is mainly there to receive the UTC signal which synchronizes the system, but can provide backup for the ship's primary GPS. 
it must be sighted where it has a clear all-round view and away from the satellite antenna, for example, which can cause interference. Given that all the ships in any vicinity are transmitting AIS information on just two VHF channels, how do they not interfere with each other? AIS makes use of SOT-DMA, self-organizing time division multiple access. In practice, each ship's information is transmitted in short bursts of data in tiny time slots. 2,250 time slots per minute. The time slots for all the vessels in an area are fixed according to Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. Other vessels will transmit their data in adjacent time slots. The clever part is that the system organizes itself. New vessels joining the group automatically find their own time slots. Imagine a number of people in a room who want to introduce themselves. If you ask the first person to speak and then ask the rest to follow on, they do so very well without interfering with each other and without talking over each other. If as the keeper of the books you keep a record of which order everybody speaks in, then you know there is an order and you've set it up. And this is what SOTDMA does. It gets everybody to speak in turn, and then it regulates who speaks into which slot. Each vessel is effectively at the centre of a group which extends as far as good VHF reception allows. If the waterway becomes too crowded and all the time slots are occupied, the system automatically rejects the weaker signals from more distant vessels. In effect, the group reduces in size, but each vessel still sees all the vessels in its vicinity. Certain information about a ship will never change and should be entered into the AIS when it is installed. This so-called static information includes the IMO number, the maritime mobile service identity, call sign, name, length, beam, the type of ship, and the location of the primary GPS antenna on the ship. This information need only be entered once, but it is very important that it is entered accurately, particularly the antenna location. It has already been reported that incorrectly entered antenna locations have given ships positions more than 50 meters out, a substantial error in crowded waterways, and one revealed when the radar and AIS targets are separated. A record of the static information should be kept on the bridge in case the system fails and it needs to be re-entered. Then there is voyage information which should be entered before leaving port. The ship's destination, her draft, her cargo, an ETA, and optionally, her route plan. The dynamic information which completes the message enters the system automatically from various sensors. These are the GPS, the time in UTC needed for synchronization, derived from the AIS's own GPS sensor, and optionally, the log, the gyro, and the rate of turn indicator. From these, the processor determines the ship's position, her course over ground, her speed over ground, her heading, and her rate of turn. The accuracy of these sources of information should be checked periodically. Navigational status, such as at anchor, underway by engines, engaged in fishing, are entered manually. All this information is transmitted to other vessels on a continual basis, and it is also updated at frequent intervals. Static and voyage information is updated every six minutes, whereas dynamic information, like position, speed, and course, may be updated every two seconds, depending on the ship's speed. 
So the system is extremely fast in informing all other vessels of a particular ship's situation. The system is completed by the communications element linked to the antennas and the display unit. Thus, every AIS-equipped vessel and shore station is able to see many details of every other AIS-equipped vessel. We have a name of the ship, we have ID, it means the number of the ship, IMO number, we have a call sign, we have information about the ship, that type of the ship is a passenger's cargo or something else, we have the ETA of the ship, we have a destination of the ship, we have uh, how many guests we carry if it's a passenger ship like us. So if I want to call a ship close to me, I know exactly the name of the ship and it's so easy for the other ship to answer to me because I call the ship by name. But the important question arises, how should all this information be displayed? As yet, there is no standardization for the user interface. The minimum requirement specified by the IMO is the so-called minimum keyboard and display. Uh, this particular unit is a very small display and that it's very difficult to readily see on the display what targets we're trying to identify and uh, the small push buttons are difficult to operate and the menu system in the unit is um, not user friendly. Personally I find it very slow to use. It is simple but it's very slow at scrolling through. The location of it isn't particularly pleasant it's, uh, it's on the top there at the chart table. It would be nice to have something low down that you could look down into. It wouldn't be affected by light conditions uh, and other things like that. Sighting of the MKD is important, especially if it is the only source of AIS information. Ideally, it should be close to the radar and to where VHF transmissions are made. However, AIS information becomes much more useful if it is displayed directly on the radar or an electronic chart system. Right now, should I say, it's best on radars because essentially all ships have radars, but not all ships have electronic charts. But in an ideal world, when every ship would have an electronic chart, obviously it would be better to have it on the electronic chart. Looking ahead, it is highly likely that integrated navigation systems will combine all the displays, radar, electronic charts, and AIS on one screen. This will be a very useful development, as long as it can be configured by the user to suit the current situation at any time. Too much information displayed on a screen could be counterproductive. At present, there are interim guidelines recommending how targets should be displayed on radar or electronic charts. A target is usually represented by an isosceles triangle showing the vessel's orientation. Once the target is selected, it is enclosed in a rectangular box and detailed information about it is displayed in a separate screen area. A solid vector shows its heading and a dashed vector shows its speed and course over ground. If the vessel is maneuvering, the solid vector gains a small direction tag, whilst the dashed course over ground might become a curved path prediction. If a target becomes dangerous, infringing closest point of approach limits, the symbol turns red. If the system loses a target, the triangle remains for a while, but with a straight line across its middle. However, it must be stressed that at the moment the symbology is not uniform, so navigators must become familiar with the displays on their own ship. Some electronic chart displays, when switched to a large scale, particularly within a port area, will replace the triangle with an accurate representation of a ship's outline. The fact that AIS displays another ship's range and bearing raises the question, is it a useful tool for collision avoidance? After all, there have been situations where radar has contributed to wrong decision-making. For example, 
When a typical tanker makes a turn, its true position is represented by the pivot point amidships. But the main radar reflection is from the superstructure at the stern. For a short while, this swings in the opposite direction, and it is this change that is detected by ARPA. For a short time, ARPA displays an incorrect course prediction and can take up to three minutes to correct itself. AIS, in contrast, uses the vessel's own gyro and rate of turn data and displays the course change correctly, straight away. The performance of radar is also compromised by clutter, rain and snow, and target swap. Does this mean that AIS is to be preferred to radar? Not yet. Radar is tried and tested, whereas AIS is a very young technology. In terms of collision avoidance, we use the radar system. Um, we follow the rule of the road. The AIS system is a, an aid to navigation. We use it in conjunction with other facilities on the bridge. But as a primary source of anti-collision, it's mainly the ARPA radar. Using AIS for collision avoidance purposes, you have to be very careful that you believe that the information coming from the other ship is correct. Whereas if you use an ARPA for collision avoidance, or radar for collision avoidance, you know that your sensors are telling you what you want to know. AIS depends on each ship's information having been entered correctly and for the dynamic information going into each AIS being correct, neither of which can be guaranteed. Many vessels, particularly fishing boats, leisure craft and warships, will probably not be equipped with AIS. AIS is also reliant on the satellite-derived GPS signal not being interrupted and for it not being compromised by any shipborne source neither of which can be guaranteed. Of course, if one vessel's data has not been entered correctly, that error might be reproduced down the chain. Masters will also retain the right to switch off their AIS if they think it appropriate. For instance, in areas known for piracy or during a tanker's cargo handling operations in port. It must be stressed that at present there is no provision in the collision regulations for the use of AIS information. I must venture and say at this point in time that the widespread use of AIS should not lead us to think that it might result in a widespread amendments to the call regs. No, the call regs have withstood the test of time and we haven't gained much experience with AIS. So it would be premature to come to that conclusion. My personal opinion is that the collision regulations have existed for a long time. They're proven in practice and it will be far better to improve the training and understanding of the collision regulations than it will be to alter the collision regulations to take account of advances in technology. With so many instruments and displays at his disposal on the modern bridge, is it possible that the addition of AIS could actually confuse the officer on watch? It is possible that the officer of the watch will be faced with an overload of information and that he will require to filter some of this information and to decide how much of the information he actually uses and how much of the information he actually needs. Over-reliance on electronic aids has led in the past to the watchkeeper accepting what was depicted as reality without cross-checking other sources. Too much reliance on electronics starts to draw people away from actually looking out the window, and that's something I've always been a proponent of. These are great tools. Um, they can enhance your uh, situational awareness, but they still are just tools. So it is right to be cautious. But there is no doubt when properly used, AIS does provide a wide range of useful information. Remembering that AIS was initially developed to enable maritime countries to identify ships passing through their waters, the system is rapidly being installed at VTS and Coast Guard stations. 
the UK's Maritime and Coast Guard Agency station on the cliffs of Dover monitors up to 500 vessel movements per day through the English Channel and has been equipped with AIS since January 2003. With the introduction of AIS, the workload for our operators has uh, improved. Uh, they do not have to interrogate as many vessels and spend longer on the radio getting in the information from the vessels. A lot of the information is provided by the AIS signal transponder. For instance, ferries no longer need to verbally report into us. If they carry an AIS transponder, then we can get the information of their transit from the AIS signal. AIS also assists in planning berth occupancy, navigational safety, and the identification of hazardous cargoes. As well as seeing all the ships passing through its waters, a shore station transmits its own position via AIS. The technology will also allow it to transmit the positions of nearby aids to navigation, so-called pseudo-AIS targets. Some aids to navigation will have AIS units physically fitted on them, uh, whereas other aids to navigation will have a signal transmitted by a base station on their behalf. So as far as a ship is concerned, it, looking, looking at its display, it will see um, effectively an AIS signal from the aids to navigation station. Occasionally, a pseudo-AIS target's position might need to be updated, for instance, if a buoy has drifted over time. In the United States, some pilot associations have been using a version of AIS for five years or more. The experience gained is extremely beneficial. Captain John Rassi is a pilot in Tampa Bay, Florida. His carrier board unit consists of a laptop computer, a small transmitter box that serves as a wireless link to the antenna package, and the antenna package which is hung on the rail outside. This consists of a VHF DSC radio, a battery, an internal GPS antenna, the AIS transponder, and a telescoping antenna which collects both the VHF signal and a differential GPS correction signal. Tampa Bay is a wide expanse of mainly very shallow water, with the dredged navigation channel 46 miles long, but only 150 meters wide. The port area has an array of interlocking narrow channels. Tampa is the destination for large cruise ships as well as vessels carrying dangerous cargoes such as petroleum, LPG and anhydrous ammonia. Safe traffic management is essential and the pilot's unit has proved its worth continuously updating positional information on charts which may be expanded to a very large scale and with accurate depth contours. It's a very precise navigation tool so the pilot can assess accurately where his vessel is in the channel, left or right of the center line of the dredge cut. The additional part is the AIS component. Now what the AIS component's been able to help us do is manage traffic silently. It's a self-contained system that allows us to handle the traffic without a lot of uh, verbal discussion. Leave it hard, starboard. Stop engine. Stop engine. Where the channel branches, a delicate maneuver is necessary. And half ahead. Half ahead. The pilot's knowledge of local waters is paramount but the display confirms the ship's position to within three meters. Because the pilot's units are transmitting AIS, their positions can also be monitored in the Tampa Port Authority's control room. Here, the same vector charts are available, with additional information on tide, current, and meteorological conditions updated every six minutes information which can be conveyed back to the pilots. As ships increase in size, speed assessment and control become more critical on the approach to wars and terminals. The laptop displays the vessel's length and beam realistically 
and accurately portrays its motion, including lateral movements and skidding. The weight of this carry-on unit is a factor. But with ships themselves being equipped with AIS transponders, new units which will connect to the specially positioned pilot plug will be much smaller. The heaviest components in our box right now are the battery and the transponder radio itself. So we'd be down to a laptop, an antenna, and a couple of wires, which would cut the weight considerably. An additional function available with AIS is the sending of short safety related binary messages. Because all AIS information is in digital format, spare capacity in the system can be used for sending short text messages of up to 158 characters each. Again, the way this will develop will become clearer with time, but it is likely that ship-to-ship -ship messaging will concentrate on reporting hazards to navigation. While shorter ship transmissions will give out harbour and berth information. In both cases, the system promises a reduction in VHF voice traffic. The system is not designed to provide personal email. The original schedule for the implementation of AIS required different classes of ship to be fitted between 2002 and the end of 2008. The events of September the 11th, 2001 and associated security concerns have accelerated the schedule, such that nearly all Solus vessels must be equipped with AIS by the end of 2004. The use of AIS is a rapidly evolving scenario. A long-range system, whereby satellites will poll information from a distant ship and therefore nearby ships, two or three times a day is envisaged. Class B AIS, a less stringently specified system, in the future may be fitted to smaller vessels like leisure craft and fishing boats. In heavily crowded waters, it will probably be the case that Class A displays will be able to filter out the Class B targets. As part of their normal ship management procedures, companies will produce operating instructions for AIS, which will need to be followed by all navigating officers. We must remember that although AIS and radar display positional information in a similar way, they're based on very different technologies. Radar, under the sole control of the user, gives the target's position relative to own ship whereas AIS, which relies on the other vessels transmitting information correctly, compares absolute positions according to GPS. AI the essential differences between the technologies is important in deciding how to make the best use of them.